Hi, my name is Richmond Wong. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, and I'm presenting research started during my dissertation, focusing on the work that user experience or UX professionals do to attempt to create ethical change from positions within large US technology companies. The project focuses on what I term values work, the practices and tactics employed in the name of addressing social values and ethical issues. This research has roots in values and design research, which studies how technical artifacts promote or embody particular social values, and design approaches to address values in design, such as value-sensitive design. I build in particular on research by Shilton, Gray, and Chivakula that studies how technology practitioners and designers surface and address social values and ethical issues in their day-to-day -day work. My project focuses specifically on UX professionals and their everyday practices to address ethical issues that also intersect with practices to resist or contest how work is done at their companies. Between 2018 and 2019, I talked with 12 UX professionals living in North America who work at six different organizations in the US that create enterprise and consumer software products. They're all self-identified as explicitly trying to address values and ethical issues as a part of their work. I also conducted participant observation at San Francisco area meetup events aimed at technology professionals who would discuss issues related to design, social values, and ethics. I should note that my focus is on ethical resistance practices that are done from the position of everyday work within large technology companies. My main analytical lens draws from the concept of soft resistance developed by Jamie Sherman and Don Nafis to describe data practices related to the quantified self as a critical alternative to other modes of data practices, but done so in a way that does not contest all forms of datafied categories. In my site, I'm using soft resistance to understand how the UX professionals try to resist practices done by their tech company employers while still trying to be at least partially legible to organizational decision makers, often by utilizing dominant but problematic logics of the tech industry. Described by Metcalf et al., some of these dominant logics include appeals to meritocracy, that hiring the quote unquote best people will lead to ethical decisions, uh, technical solutionism, that best practices will lead to ethical technical solutions, and market fundamentalism, that ethical solutions will add economic value. The high level takeaway from this paper is that values work goes beyond making changes in technical design. It also includes trying to make changes to organizational culture, processes, and work practices, as well as navigating organizational power dynamics. There's a lot of practices that I observed or heard about, but broadly they fall into one of three goals or changes that these UX professionals seek when trying to address values and ethics in their organization. Creating more space for UX professionals to address values and ethics, making values visible and relevant to others in the organization, changing organizational processes and orientations towards values. For each of these intended goals, there are several tactics that are used, but given the short time today, I'll give one example for the second and third goals and then provide some higher level reflections. One goal of the interviewed UX professionals involves them trying to get other people in their organization to see values and ethics as important and relevant to their work. One tactic here is to rhetorically make values visible to other organizational stakeholders. UX professionals generally do not have decision-making power and need to translate their values concerns to decision makers, such as product managers, and show why this is a legitimate concern by the language they use. Brittany, who is a user researcher on an enterprise software product, discussed how human-centered arguments to promote the well-being of end users, who are generally workers of uh, client companies, will not always convince managers who are more concerned with the needs of the enterprise clients. She instead makes the issue visible and legitimate to other managers by describing it as a financial or reputational risk. For instance, Brittany said she might argue, quote, We've already seen that we may get some negative feedback, negative press, negative social media on the small scale. If we roll this feature out more widely, it's a risk that we're going to get a lot more negative feedback. And what that means is that we're losing trust with these client companies. Trust has always been our number one value. This is a significant reputational harm or reputational risk. 
So Brittany frames the problem as one of reputational risk for her organization in order to make the issue of worker well-being or end-user well-being visible and legible to product managers. Others reported making similar arguments in terms of either reputational or financial risk in order to make their concerns legible. These rhetorical and framing tactics can be useful and powerful, but they are also limited in that not all social values and ethical issues can be easily translated into the language of reputational risk or financial loss. Another goal is to change the organization's processes and orientations towards values. One tactic to do this is when UX professionals tactically refer to corporate values and mission statements. In part, this attempts to change the processes and politics of the organizations they work for by changing how values are conceptualized. One user researcher described that she could use her company's corporate value of equality as a way to start bringing in social justice topics into work conversations. Yet she noted that this required negotiating what these values mean and how they should be interpreted. Other people in the organization don't necessarily see the same connection between the corporate value of equality and the broader issues of social justice. At another company, Nova describes how their company's public statements on diversity and inclusion have provided cover to push forward initiatives around gender inclusivity within the company, saying, quote, I feel like it's giving me a lot of leeway to be able to say I'm acting in line with company principles. So from the outside, we might look at these corporate value statements around promoting equality or diversity as not having much weight behind them. However, these statements can create some space within the company for workers like Nova and others to contest and bring new interpretations to their company's values and principles. Also, tactical engagement with corporate values can help UX professionals get buy-in from more powerful decision makers in the organization by rhetorically aligning their work with the organization's stated goals, even if they're actually advancing those goals in slightly more radical ways. I'm going to turn to a few reflections. The paper provides more details about the effective and gendered aspects of this labor, but today I want to focus on the partiality or softness of these tactics. In trying to create ethical change from positions within large technology companies, interviewees often utilize dominant logics of the tech industry, which are often problematic or limited, like framing ethical issues as being about financial risk or financial return. This softness or partiality is not because of willful ignorance. Indeed, several interviewees discussed feeling ambivalent about engaging in these logics and their argumentation, but they also described tensions in how they could try to create change without losing their jobs. As we've seen, large tech companies in the past have fired workers who are seen as being too active or pushing too far on ethical concerns. So these everyday tactics represent attempts to change technology organizations from positions within and often from positions below, given that UX professionals often do not have as much power or prestige as other technology professionals within these companies. So these are not ineffective practices. Some forms of change are possible through them. When thinking about ethical change in technology companies, we might consider these tactics from within as complementary to ongoing legal, political, social, and community efforts that are occurring external to the company. This research has implications for researchers and stakeholders involved in values and design. For designers and researchers developing new values and ethics design tools, a lot of current design tools focus on addressing ethics during the technical design process. This research suggests that a lot of UX professionals' values at work exist outside of the design process. So we might move from thinking about value-centered design to values-advocate-centered design to support the social and organizational work. Values and ethics design tools can better account for the positionality of UX and designers in large corporations as well. A lot of design tools for ethics imagine that they can be successfully used and adopted by an empowered designer, but often they don't have that kind of agency in practice. For practitioners, the tactics described in the paper suggest points of intervention to discuss or address values and ethical issues. And the research suggests finding ways to empower and compensate frontline workers who are doing values work. More broadly, this research suggests studying and supporting values and ethics work from a range of positionalities and modalities that go beyond technical practice to also consider social, organizational, and political practices. 
So thank you to the interviewees and to many others who provided feedback on this research.